much, there's so much truth in that song. There's so much power in that song. It's not about the rhythm or the beats. It's about the words and the word of that song. And that's in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is powerful. It's healing. It's, it's, it breaks strongholds. There's this, this phrase there. I love it. It says, I'm going to shout Jesus for my family. And can I just tell you, I, in, just, in just a moment, we're going to have families here on the, the platform, and we're going to, going to pray over families as they raise children in, in, in this respect and honor of the Lord. But there, there, there is this idea in this song that I just felt like the Lord was, was speaking to me for you, and that's moms and dads that may feel very inadequate to even live out the word of the words of that song. And you, you may feel like because of some things in your past, or you're, you're just the feeling of inadequacy that there's no way you could could be that for your mom, for your for your kids. And I just want to tell you that as a lie from the enemy, that God has placed you in the place that you are for such a time as this. And even when moms and dads, us as parents, when we feel inadequate, that's the best time for us to say Jesus over my family because that's when we need his grace. And so I just know that there are families all over this room. Some of you may be joining with us online and and maybe your, your family's in a weird spot relationally. Keep speaking the name of Jesus and reflecting Jesus' love and grace in your families. And in that name, in that power that's behind that name, boy, there's strongholds that are, that are broken. There's healing that takes place in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, oh, I, love, I love being in God's, God's house with his family. Turn around and say hi and shake hands. Maybe high five someone uh, as you're seated here with the family of God. Amen. Amen. If you're joining with us online, we just want to say welcome. Once again, you're part of the family. And uh, we've, we've said it already, but we do count it an honor that you would spend some time here with us today and just worshiping together with us. Uh, we, just, we just love you and value you and what you're doing and uh, being a part of God's family. So today is a special day, and I know we've got some families that that are here with us in the room that uh, they're, they're, they maybe have some kiddos that may be getting a little anxious and ready for, for us to get moving. So I understand that. And I, I just, as pastor here, this is kind of since we've been here, first time we've had an opportunity to uh, uh, invite families to make kind of a public uh, profession, so to speak, of our uh, commitment to raise kiddos in an environment that God would would uh, bless and just re- be the center of everything that we do. And so I'm going to ask three very important people to bring their families up on the stage with them here today. And we've got some pastors that are going to help us and they're going to bring their families and extended family, whoever wants to come up and be a part of kind of the little huddle. And I'm going to ask Charlie Rose carry on. Would you bring your family up here? Um, and all of the, 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 uh, siblings or whomever else wants to come. And then Emma Parker, would you bring your family up as well? And then Miles Walter, uh, would you bring your family up? And we'll just do kind of the carry-ons over here and the Parkers in the middle and then the Walters over on the other side there. And we're just, aren't these good looking um, kiddos and moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas? We have an opportunity here at Calvary Church to celebrate with these families. And, and uh, I just, I think this is an awesome group of, of uh, good looking men and women, including you, Pastor G. I'll put you in there too. So there you go. I'm teasing. But uh, by the way, if you were here as they're still coming up, did you enjoy Pastor G's message last week? Wasn't it great? Yeah. I honor you, sir, and the, the word that, that God allowed you to speak through through you. So, wow, wow. They're just keeping keeping on coming, and they're, they're all over the place. It's just so great to see these families here. Um, you know, as they're still coming here, we've got a representative of some of the pastoral staff going to be with them and pray with them just a minute. 
Some of you that may be new at this, you say, what in the world? What's this idea of baby or child dedication? And, and, and how does that play a part in what, what is happening here at the church? Well, the truth of it is, is that everything that we do here at Calvary, we want to make sure that there is a biblical foundation for, for how we worship the Lord. And the Bible tells a really incredible story in the book of 1 Samuel. And it tells the story of this this mom who has prayed for years to have a child. And for some reason, God had not allowed that to happen. And Hannah, the Bible says that she even got to the point where she was depressed and she was crying and she was fearful because God had not yet given her a child. And then yet in God's timing which I'm sure all of you as moms and dads understand timing. Sometimes our kiddos appear at at the time we planned and other times it's just, wow, a surprise. But in God's timing, God allowed Hannah to uh, to give birth to a son named Samuel. And as a response to that blessing blessing of God that uh, she experienced in her life, she um, brought Samuel to the church, to the temple, to the house of the Lord. And she made a commitment. She said, because I prayed for this child and God has blessed me with this child, I will return to him, uh, return to the Lord this blessing. And she actually left her son Samuel at the church. That's not what we're doing here today. Can I just tell you? I'm not even going to look at him because some of them say, just for a little bit, please. It'll just be. But there was this posture in a mom's heart that said, I recognize the blessing that God has given me in this child and I want to return to him. And so as, as, a, as a sign of our same posture in this moment of dedication, we don't, as a church, we don't believe that, that God's word teaches us that we're dedicating these children to um, claim or purchase their salvation. There will be a time in their life where they make that decision um, hopefully to follow Jesus for themselves. So, so really our time here today is more of a family dedication than it is necessarily of the children. And I know that uh, I, I know many of you very well, and I'm so honored to partner together with you as families as you make a decision to say, hey, we're going we're gonna to dedicate this child. But more than that, it's, it's us dedicating ourselves to provide an environment for these children to grow and in the respect and love and fear of of the Lord. And so Charlie Rose is here and she's sacked out and Trudy is saying, thank you, Jesus. So, and you're saying, Pastor John, you better hurry because we're on a clock here. Uh, And then Emma as well. And then Miles over here has brought incredible family with him as well. And so these these children that uh, God's blessed you as moms and dads with and uh, it's a moment for us as moms and dads to really dedicate our hearts and our lives to say we'll raise these, these children in an environment that they, they fear, fear God in a respect way and honor God. And so moms and dads, um, some of you are wondering, say, man, what's this process going to look like? I'm gonna, it's, it's a commitment that you're making and a dedication that I want to ask you a few questions. And after the end of those questions, I think that our response and families as well would just be to say, We'll, we will uh, make this commitment. I want to ask you if you in this moment are, are making the commitment as a family to say we'll raise these children in an environment in a home where they see mom and dad, first of all, love Jesus and, and serve him to the best of our abilities. We're going to mess up. We're going to make mistakes and they're going to see us be authentic and they're going to see us following after Jesus in a way that would bring honor to him. Grandmas and grandpas and family, if you're here today and you say, hey, we'll do our best to wrap our arms around them and provide an environment for them to, to love and serve Jesus as well. I'm going to ask you all corporately because we've got a big group who won't go individually. But if that's your desire and you say, we will do that, can you we all just respond by saying, we will? We will. We will. Church, I'm going to ask you to stand with me. And we're going to pray a prayer over these, these kiddos. Because the truth of it is, is that as these families stand here and make a commitment, we, we join our hands and our arms together with these children and these moms and dads to say, this is not a thing that we ask you to do alone, that we're going to be there. You see, there's, there's, there's nursery workers in this room here. There's, there's, there's small group leaders standing here in the room that these children are going to have an opportunity to be a part of, that, that there's this spiritual mom and dad sitting in the room that some of these children are going to look up to. 
and it's a commitment that we make as well. So I'm going to ask you as a congregation, if you're in a position to say, you know what, we will we'll make a commitment to these families, not just to these children, but to the moms and dads that will provide an environment that loves Jesus. We'll do everything that we can to show them how to experience God in their lives. And we'll model a, a reverence for his word and for his church. If that's your heart, would you do me a favor and join with these families and say, we will. We will. Families, I want to say as a pastor of this church, I will. And I'm telling you, there's a heaviness in a good way of when God's family and church joins our heart together to say we will stand up for this next generation and we'll stand up for, for kiddos to, to fight for them and to know that we, we have been placed in a unique position and responsibility to, to stand in the gap. And as a church, we will do that with you as well. So church, I'm going to ask you, we've got some of our pastoral uh, team up here that's going to lay their hands on these moms and dads and kiddos with me. They're going to have to fight through the crowd a little bit to do that. But uh, um, church, I'm going to ask you to join with me in this prayer. Would you do me a favor and stretch your hands towards these families? We can't all be up here, but let's pray that God would bless these kids and these families as we just dedicate our hearts to the Lord. Father, I thank you so much for what you're doing little Charlie Rose. I pray that you would just bless her. God, I pray that you would anoint her. God, I pray that you would set her apart from this day forward to be an incredible light and example for you. For little Emma, God, I pray that you would just touch her life. God, protect her all the days of her life. God, I pray that you would allow her hands and her feet to go where you lead her, where you guide her. God, protect this family. Father, I thank you so much for little Miles. God, I thank you what you're doing, this man of God, that you would just create in him a hunger and a passion for you like never before. God, I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you, Lord, for these moms and dads that have joined here with me on this stage to just make a commitment to you, just like Hannah did with her son Samuel, that we would say, God, you have blessed our families and we return them to you. God, for your glory, and we just give you all the praise and glory. Bless these families in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we give these families a hand here today? Our pastors have a small gift for you guys. They have a gift that they want to give to you, moms and dads. There's a little blanket in there and a Bible that we've uh, given to these kiddos that we just want that to be a blessing to you. Thank you, families, moms and dads. I honor you and your your commitment and dedication. Amen. One more time, as you're seated and as they're seated, can you give them a hand as they go this morning? Awesome. How are you? You doing good? That's a big bag. Awesome. 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 Amen. Amen. When we talk about next gen ministry, that's that's a pretty good representation of it, right? Boy, those are some great families. I kind of threw an audible in our order here a little bit just because I knew that uh, uh, kiddos, the, the timeline was ticking there a little bit. So thank you for for letting me have that honor of of doing that uh, in this moment. Um, I jumped over an opportunity that we have to continue to worship the Lord, and that's in our giving. The message that we have today is from Acts chapter 5, and it talks about a a posture, a mindset of generosity that uh, these individuals in God's Word, um, they were struggling with. And I'm so glad to be a part of a church family that does not struggle with that that we are a generous people and God continues to bless through us so that we can touch people all over this community and the world. And so thank you for doing that. We worship the Lord in our giving and we do that by returning to him his tithes, uh, which is that first 10% of our resources and then bringing to him our offerings. You can do that in several ways. The envelopes on those seat pockets in front of you, you can give physically and put those in the buckets on your way out. You can give online, calvarytriad.com slash give, or you can text the amount to 84321. 
mentioned last week, and uh, you heard uh, just some of the, you've heard this every month as we go through this, this vision of living it out as it relates to kingdom builders. We're continuing in that focus this month um, for reaching a generation. Several of our team is with uh, are with the teams there in South Africa and the, the area that Reaching a Generation is ministered in and then they have impact in Namibia as well. We've, you've heard last week we have a goal this month of $20,000 that God's going to allow us to be a blessing to the ministry there and I, I just am so excited. We're well on our way so I just want to remind you of that as well. Kingdom Builders is not just about a global impact however. It's also about local reach as well. If you came through the Kingdom Builders gallery on your way into service today, you saw backpacks all over. How cool is that, that we get to partner together with families that may be struggling as sending kiddos back to school in the next few weeks, or they've, some of them have already gone, um, for us to say, hey, we've, we've invested some time and money and resources to provide fully equipped backpack ready to go back to school with school supplies. And that here's how that works. If you know a family that is in need, that uh, you say this would really be a blessing to them, why don't you be the hands and feet of Jesus to that family and grab one of those backpacks on your way out and make that an opportunity for you to knock on a door today, maybe with a neighbor or a family member and say, you know what, Calvary Church, we just wanna say we love you and here's a blessing to you. So the way that works is really simple. You walk back there, you pick up a backpack and you go give it to someone. It's really complicated, right? So it's funny, I was in the lobby a minute ago and uh, two people came and they had their backpacks and they were taking some so do we need to fill out anything? I was like, no, you need to go be a blessing. So really go take the backpack and go be a blessing to people. And uh, we're excited about that. We talk about kingdom builders. This is one of the, these are, are so many different ways, but this is one of the ways for that uh, to be a blessing. Next, or this coming Saturday, this coming Saturday is an incredible day for us to launch into a, a rebirth and a recalibration, a reset of the min, one of the main ministry strategies here at Calvary Church, and that is as it relates to small groups. Can I tell you this? I love the Sunday morning corporate worship experience. I love being in God's house. I love you as the family of God being here. This is fun. It's great. But it's not all there is. And if you are depending upon this Sunday morning, just a worship experience to be the fullness of your development and growth in following Jesus, you're missing out. And as it relates to the, the fullness of what God wants for us, Jesus even modeled it. He had a small group of himself, right? And, and, and the, three, the, the three disciples that were closest to him, Peter, James, and John. And then he had the 12, and he modeled that to us that we would be in community with each other. Small groups are the way that is done. You say, what is a small group? Well, it could mean a class. It could mean a teaching moment. It could mean a relational time where you get together with other people that have similar interests. This past summer and then last few months, our uh, Inspire Women's Ministry have had different groups. They've been gardening and walking and doing all kinds of different things. It's just incredible. Some groups get together that, that maybe have walked through seasons of their lives that they've lost a spouse. And, and there's, there's a commonality there. I'm telling you this, that we're a church such as that, that the size that we are, we cannot minister to the needs uh, that we all have effectively if we just depend on this big group to do that. But our needs are ministered to more effectively in small group. And I, I promise you, God will allow that to be a blessing to you. If you're the, 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 the spectator only person, this makes you feel a little uncomfortable. It, it, it's real, it's good, it's right. I personally have a, have a small group that I'm a part of every Wednesday morning. It's on my calendar, the staff knows at 9.30, I meet with five guys virtually, that they're all over the world now, that are friends of mine that we, we, we just connect. We talk about life. We cut up and make jokes. We pray for each other. And we, we are a small group. And that's great. We have a small group that Pastor Kim and myself were uh, starting here in a few weeks with some couples here in the church that, that we are doing a small group as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm spending some time here to let you know this is really important that God would uh, allow you to be a part of that. You say, I've never been a part of a small group before. Now's your time.
well, I don't know if I'm supposed to be a part or lead. Now's your time. Just, just, just show up Saturday, this coming Saturday. You're going to hear some vision, and then you're going to hear some training on how to do, uh, how to lead possibly a small group. Say, I have no training. I can't lead a small group. We're going to make it so easy for you that anyone can lead a small group. And that's our hope and our desire, that we would have small groups all over the triad of representation of, of, of what God is doing here in Calvary in, in little small groups all over. Are you with me? Say amen. Oh, uh, there's about, about 50%. So the, that 50% needs to go find the other 50% and say, hey, Saturday, I'll come pick you up. It's 10 o'clock. Anyway. Finally, August 31st, uh, a week from Wednesday, we're going to spend a time in worship and prayer and, and going back into school and prayer for families. I love what we just saw represented here on the, the stage. Uh, that Wednesday night, we're going to spend a time in worship, and then we're going to pray for moms and dads and kids as they go back into school, for teachers and administrators as they go back into school as well. Um, it's going to be a good time for us to launch into the fall. I'm so excited about the next couple of weeks of ministry. Next week, you're going to hear the official kind of kickoff launch of different small group ministries. It's going to be awesome. Pastor Scott and I have been talking through some, some things as how that plays out. The whole weekend next week is going to be really a small group focus. The week after that, I've got some special uh, friends of mine uh, that are going to be here with me. We're going to, I'm going to be ministering and, and, and sharing some of those stories about how God is using relational connections to impact the world. God's just setting us up for a great fall. I'm so excited about it. And uh, today it starts with with, uh, I wish you, if you remember two weeks ago, we talked about uh, moments that matter and just that, you know, wow, these are some powerful moments. And Pastor G brought such a great word last week. Uh, it was just spot on. I was really proud of the continuation of the same heart even last week. But I got to be honest, this week is, a, is kind of a tough word. It's a heavy and, and it's struggling for, for me to say, okay, man, there are those moments where we just want to be kind of like, yes, this is awesome, and I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, and you know, the joy of the Lord, and, you know, all that. and yet there's this, this time when God's allowed us to go through the book of Acts where there are these moments in the birth of the early church where, where it was a tough word, and so Acts chapter 5 is where we'll be here in just a minute. I'm going to invite you, if you've got your tablet, device, or phone, or Bible, just go there, Acts chapter 5. Before we do that, I do want to say uh, thank you for praying, uh, just letting us be gone for uh, a week. You say, I didn't even know you were gone. That's great. That's awesome. So uh, that's even better. The, the team just did a great job. We had a little vacation and took time away with our kiddos and my, my family. We went down to Texas, spent a few days, and then got on a big boat and the uh, cruise down through the Gulf of Mexico to Cozumel, and uh, it was awesome. I love my family. It was great to be with them, but here's the victory for me, right? Cruise ships, if you've been on a cruise ship, you understand that they're not the best place in the world to diet and to stay healthy. I can tell you that there was a moral victory. Somebody just got blessed right there. He said, you can remember that buffet, right? So I can tell you a moral victory for me. I only gained three pounds last week, so only three pounds. So yeah, that was good. I don't know, don't, don't clap for that, you know, whatever. But uh, for me, it was like, wow. But we were able to be gone and in, enjoyed family a little bit this past week. And it, it, was, a, it was a great time, a little, little recharge. While I was there, I was at my parents' house for a few days. And, uh, you know, it's great to go to grandma's house, right? And uh, it's always good. You walk in, I don't know what the house is for you, but there's those moments of familiarity where you can just go into somebody's house and you, you feel really great. And it's just like at home. Well, that's, that's kind of how my parents' house is. And there's this place in my, my mom and dad's uh, kitchen that is kind of a, an interesting spot for me. It has memories attached to it. And she's got this thing in, in her kitchen. And I don't even know what it's called. It's like a little hutch type thing. It's an antique thing. And on the side of this hutch, there's all of these pencil marks. Right there's these marks, and Chloe's probably got one of those, several of those marks, you know. But at the side of these these marks, there's the kiddos, the grandkids' names attached to them. You say, what are those? You guys are already there with me. It's Grandma's way of tracking the growth of all the grandkids. You may have it on like a door jam or something at your house and Grandma's house. You know that. But in our house, it's on this little piece of furniture, and there's all these marks. And throughout the, the growth of all the grandkids, right, it, it's to track where they are, how tall they are, whatever. And it's interesting because when they're, they're young, it's like your age, all the older kids are obviously taller than the younger kids. But then there's this, there's this season where usually the, the guys kind of surpass the girls, right? In fact, we've got some 
tall kiddos in our family, and my son's one of them, that they've had to add extensions onto the hutch, right, to get the marks to go up higher. Well, I love my mom, and she's probably watching online or was earlier this morning, but I got to just tell on her a little bit here because I have seen a lack of integrity in my mother. <laughs> Can't even say it with a straight face. I have seen the moment where my mom would lay the ruler on top of the young child's head, right, to measure where they're at. And knowing that the importance for that child was to be taller than the the sibling, the the younger or whatever, I've seen my mom in all of the integrity she has do something that I just can't believe. She would live a life of such deceit and deception as such that she would just slightly tilt the ruler so that that particular child would think, I've grown and I'm still taller than my sibling. And mom, if you're watching, there's still time. You can repent and turn from, no, I'm just teasing. I wonder when I see things like that, how many times I've been, how many times I've been guilty of that in my life, not of my physical growth, but maybe of my spiritual growth to say, no, it's all good. I'm, I'm great. Everything's awesome. How you doing, Pastor John? Fantastic. It's incredible. Living on top of the world, dangling my feet off. You know, all that kind of, we do that, don't we always? We sometimes tilt the ruler and say, we're better than sometimes we are. We're going to read a story today about someone, and actually it was a husband and wife who, um, in a very tragic story, they metaphorically tilted that ruler, and the result of that decision was not something that we could probably laugh at, but it was tragic. And when they presented something that was untrue, their fate was was pretty tragic. So this morning, as we continue through the book of Acts, I just want to give a little uh, subtitle, and if you're taking notes, really simple, two points, be true, and then just be you. Be you, be who God has created you to be. Be be that person, no matter what it looks like, how how off center, you know, not just how miss the mark kind of whatever. God's grace is is big enough. God has created you in a unique way, and I'm so glad. I'm so glad we're not all the same. We can't all be, you know, whatever, but I'm so glad that God has created us so that God's grace can be represented in our lives, be true, be you. So Acts chapter five, here we go. It's a heavy word. Are you ready? Say yeah. Now I I watched and listened to Pastor G last week and he kept you awake a lot. In fact, I'm walking, listening to him and I'm repeating what Pastor G is asking me to repeat while I'm walking. People probably thought I was crazy, but you gotta stay with me, okay? A little bit like that. So here we go, Acts chapter five, Ananias and Sapphira. If you know the story, you know kind of the end of the story. Don't ruin it for those of us that are just, just diving into it today. Verse one, but there was a certain man named Ananias who with his wife Sapphira sold some property. He brought part of the money to the apostles claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Background to the story, chapter four of Acts, Joseph The the Bible says that Joseph sold some land as well and brought the the money from the proceeds of this land into the church, to the disciples. There was this agreement, there was this this dynamic that had been taking place in this early church of of this um, investment into. Ananias and Sapphira would have been in that same model as far as bringing from the proceeds of this. The problem was is that they brought part saying it was the whole and they kept the rest. The story says this, Peter said straight to him, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not to sell as you wished. You could have done with it whatever, but you portrayed something that wasn't true. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying lying to us, but to God. Ouch, (laughs) right? That's Peter going straight for the heart and reading his mail, so to speak, and saying, hey, you portrayed one thing, and yet the reality is something totally different. 
And the result of what God did in this particular situation was, was pretty traumatic. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Yeah, I expected there to be no amens that you, you handled that problem. That, that's tough, right? Can we just be honest and hit pause here and say, wait a second, God, you're, you're really being heavy here. There's, there's something that is, that is powerful and, and like scary. And yeah, this is what happened. He fell to the floor and died. And in the understatement of the year award, I give this to Luke when he wrote this. And he said, everyone who heard about it was terrified. Can you imagine? Let me just do a little sidebar here. Rabbit trail. I know the time. I'll be, I'm going to be fast. I promise. Can you imagine if someone was walking out today and put like an offering envelope in that says a thousand dollars and it was really a dollar bill in there or whatever? Why would you do that? Stupid, whatever. But you portrayed some and like two steps beyond the bucket, you just fell over and died right there. Can you imagine how crazy the situation would be? I, for one, would not be even walking. I mean, something's wrong with that bucket. There's something. Wrong. But this is what has taken place here. There's this, this opportunity that Ananias and Sapphira, and Ananias without his wife, but they, they're kind of in cahoots here, walks up. He says, here's all the money. And it wasn't. And boom, he dies right there. That is just messed up, right? Let's just be honest. That would shock us all, and we would be, we would be terrified. And yet we know that Luke, we heard in the beginning of the series, Luke was very concerned with the details and the specificity of these events that he was relaying. And so there wasn't like this exaggeration going on. Luke was a physician. He was worried with, here's the details and being correct. And so literally, he falls over <laughs> And died. And then I, I don't know how this happened, but can you imagine it's like these young men that were like the bouncers, I guess. I don't know. They're just like, well, okay, let's go get him. And they just walk and pick him up. And it says young men wrapped him up in a sheet, took him out and buried him. That is, that is to my knowledge, Pastor Scott, you've been here longer than I, that, to my knowledge, that has not happened at Calvary Church yet. No, I'm just teasing. I'm just, yeah, yeah. But, but can you imagine how, in, in just, Oh my goodness, if you can't like, you know, get a lesson out of that, and wow, <clears throat> I can't imagine being in that situation and that's what takes place. He falls out and dies, people wrap him up, take him out, bury him. I'm gonna tell you this right now, I would be like, number one, terrified, but I would say, God, search my heart because I, boy, and, and can I just alleviate any pressure here? This was really not a financial punishment. It really wasn't about the money. So before I, you know, all the people say, oh, that pastor, he's just worried about the money. Let me just let you off the hook right here. And, and I'll explain this a little bit in a minute. Calvary Church, we don't need your money. So there you go. God needs our heart. God wants the fullness of that, and my money is included in that because it's close to my heart, and it's a privilege for me to give to the storehouse that blesses me. So, so before you say, oh, that's all they ever talk about is money, just hold still. Let's just see what else God is talking about. But in this particular situation, it was pretty tragic. Verse 7, about three, three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, was this the price you and your husband received for your land? Yeah, she replied, that was the price. Deception again. That wasn't the price. She was portraying something that wasn't the truth. And Peter said, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? The young, well, can you imagine what was going over this woman's countenance and face? She said, when Peter says, the young men who buried your husband, I just found out my husband died are just outside the door and they will carry you out too. I just found out I'm not going to last much longer either. Wow. Wow. God's grace, God's love, God's mercy. God's also just. And his love means so much more when we know he is just, right? It's just this incredible dynamic. Instantly, she fell to the floor and died. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear, you think, gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. 
Can I tell you before we go any further, please understand if you're with us in the room and watching online, God is a God of love. God is a God of, of grace and he, and he provides it. There is a point in all of our lives, however, where we have to be true and we have to be you and say, say God, here I am in all my flaws and inadequacies. I, I, boy, I am this and I am, I am just, but for the grace of God, go I, right? We, we have an opportunity to be true. Ananias and Sapphira, their, their sin was twofold. There's one piece of this that I want to um, kind of unpack a little bit for you. And again, two points, be true, be you. When, when Luke, the writer here, uses this word uh, as it relates to the, the, the act of Ananias holding back or keeping some of the prophets, this word, I'll probably butcher the pronunciation, nosphazomai, nosphazomai, it means this, to misappropriate, to misappropriate, to, to embezzle almost. You say, well, Peter said the, the land was yours to sell and you could have done whatever you want. Yes, but in that, that history and the model of what was taking place there, if you remember I said in Acts chapter four, Joseph had sold land and he'd given the funds to the, to the church. This word was, was used one other time. It's used in scripture when it relates to the children of Israel when they were overcoming the, the city of Jericho. And, and God said to them specifically, do not take any of the goods. Don't go in and plunder. And there was a man named Achan and he went in and he took some things from that city that he was not supposed to take. He stole them. And this same word is used in that connotation, in that instance as well. And so there was this moment where Luke, having known those, those, those stories about Jericho and all this, he uses this same word to describe this action. It was as if there was this agreement to do one thing and Ananias and Sapphira conspired amongst themselves to do something else. They, they stole they took from. And we read through this context and understand that was, that was a tragedy. That was, that was great. And yet, Peter, in his words, he, he doesn't necessarily call out the financial piece of this. He says, you lied to the Holy Spirit. You portrayed something in your life that wasn't true. And so, yes, there's this sin of, of we could call it like embezzlement or theft or, or, or financial, but there was a greater issue at play here. And you may know this word, and that was this word hypocrisy. And that, that's like a real, like sometimes can be a churchy word. What does that even mean? And it was just simply this, that they were portraying something that wasn't true. They wanted the credit and the prestige for this sacrificial generosity without the inconvenience of it. And Peter accuses both of them of, of both things, this misappropriation, this falsehood, lying, this integrity. But he also says, hey, you portrayed something that you're not. Let me bring this home to all of us. We say, well, that's, that's, a, that's a big word that, you know, I, I'm, I'm fine. I'm not, I don't have hypocrisy. I'm not a hypocrite. For us, it doesn't maybe necessarily manifest itself like this all the times, but boy, it can on our social media posts. It can in the way we portray all is well. Things are great. And they're not. Come on, like you know, it's the highlight reel, right? And some of that is is just innocent. I get it. I'm uh, be positive, all that stuff. But there comes a point when we get sucked into this posture of of not really portraying truth. From a practical standpoint, in the early service, we had you guys witnessed some of it last week. If you were here, we had some technical issues, and I'm preaching in the early service, and the lights just all go out. They just all go out, and I'm sitting there going, well. There's no way we can portray anything, you know, different than that because the lights just went out, right? Or whatever. It was like God was giving us another little illustration. We're getting it fixed. It's just been a, been a journey. I understand it. But it was this moment where God was saying, okay, yeah, you make, make sure you portray what's true. Hypocrisy is the idea of saying, ah, all is well, and it not really being that way. Can I tell you that this portion of scripture here today is challenging all of us to recognize we have an opportunity to be true to God's word, that he's called us to be a generous church. He's called us to be ones that would reflect generosity, but he's also called us to, in, in those moments when, when maybe we, we've got some, some bumps and bruises and flaws to be okay and say, boy, God's grace, I need God's grace right now, and not to ever be a mom or a dad or a grandma and grandpa that would say to our children, like we saw just here, that would say, you know what, Mom's mom and dad, we never fail. We never have, you know, we're always 
smiling. We never fight. We never get, no, be honest, be truthful and, and, and allow your kids and allow us to go on that journey with you and say, you know what? It's not so much, you've heard me say this before. It's not so much the distance between you and God, but the direction. In other words, it's not, oh, look how close I am to God. And yet you're walking away from him. You're still, whatever. It's more the direction. I, boy, God, I'm, I'm really struggling right now in my life, but I'm going to take another step towards you. And I'm going to try to allow the posture of my heart to be following you more. Be true. Just be you. So first thing is this idea of being true. Paul says to the church in Corinth, as it relates to generosity, he says, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. I love that. He will provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. That's why when we come to the Lord and worship the Lord in our giving, we say we return to the Lord his tithes and out of the abundance, we're able to bring our offerings. That was Paul. That was what he was saying to this church saying, hey, if you'll model generosity, God will bless you in such a way that your blessing can be a blessing to others. That's what those backpacks represent. It's not about cool. Look at the markers and the pencils. No, it it represents us saying, hey, we want to be a generous people, we want to be true to what God has called us to be. Paul goes on, he says, as the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he'll provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Can I just coach you a little bit on this um, as, as you as families are wrestling with possibly how you worship the Lord in your giving? Number one, you'll see here in a minute in the verse in Malachi that we'll read that tithing, 10%, it's like the baseline. It's like the, 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 what God says, hey, do this. And then above that, the generosity comes into play when we bring our offerings. And some of you, that scares you. You would rather be in a place where you'd say, well, as I have to give, then I will, then I'll just give then. But, but I won't, I won't be obedient to the tithe until I have it. And then I'll give. Can I tell you that you've got it? You've really got it all wrong. What you're doing is saying, God, this hundred percent of the resources that you've given me, I can manage it and I'll give out of that. And, and, and then I'll, I'll obey after I have it. God's saying, would you just give the the first fruits to me and let me do what you can't do in the remaining 90 is I'll make that expand and increase. I'm telling you from a life lived in front of you and as, as my family from the very beginning before we even got married as a young adult started tithing. And I can tell you to this day that God has blessed my family so much uh, as we have been obedient, I love it that my kiddos, even to this day, they, they've called and said, okay, we're doing then this, this sale or this thing with our financial, do we tithe on the gross or the net? And all these questions about living it out, it's just awesome because I know God is going to bless through them. And for you as family members that are struggling with this dynamic, I just want to say, and you'll hear it in a minute from Malachi, it's just test God in it and see if he doesn't bless you beyond the generosity that God has called us to be, it's really exhilarating and, and awesome. I'll say it again. Calvary, we don't need your money. But I do want and desire for God to bless through you. And as you say, God, you can be the Lord of every part of my life. This is a piece of it too. It has a real impact on your life. It really does. Paul goes on to say, yes, you'll be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, They'll thank God. So two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God for your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. It'll prove that you're being true. Malachi says it this way. He says, should people cheat God, yet you've cheated me? And then you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? 
You've cheated, some versions say robbed. You've cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. You're under a curse for your whole nation has been cheating me. As for me and my house, I want to model to my kiddos and my family and my grandkids one day a a, a family that would honor God in every part of our lives. And we would be true to this act of generosity. I'm so glad that you're a part of that kingdom as well. And uh, it's just exciting to see God do it. Be true. Second thing that we can learn through Ananias and Sapphira is to be uniquely who God has called us to be. Philosopher Cicero said this, is of all the villainy, there is none more base than that of the hypocrite who at the moment he is most false takes care to appear most virtuous. That's a heavy statement, right? There's nothing more evil than the person who says, look at me, I'm just awesome, and they're not, right? Abraham Lincoln says it this way. He says, you can fool all the people some of the time. You can fool some of the people all the time, but you can't fool God any of the time. Honest Abe got it right there, I think. So when we get to this story of Ananias and Sapphira, I understand it's heavy. This idea of hypocrisy is not fun to deal with, right? It's like, it's it's kind of that going to the dentist as a a church. It's like, you you know you need to because it keeps you healthy, but it really sometimes is painful. And in the church, this is one of those areas that is is just really kind of a soul-searching moment. Hypocrisy is simply this, the practice of claiming to have moral standards or beliefs to which one's own behavior does not conform. That's a heavy word. That's a heavy principle for us to wrestle with. This morning, after early service, in between the services, I got a text from somebody who was in the early service, and they, they said this, basically. They said, you know what, I've been at Calvary for X number of years, and it's just been awesome to see that, that and they were in all sincerity, they said, I've never been a part of any group where this has been played out, that we've always been a part of a group here at Calvary that that would just speak the truth in love. Now, can I tell you before you say, oh, I've been a part of some groups, I don't, I don't, you know, just think that's a possibility as well. But I do want us as a church to, to lean into this truth here and say, one, individually, I'm gonna be a generous person. I'm going to be true to who God's called me to be, and and I promise you, before you get down through a rabbit trail of of deception and what the world is calling you to be, found that in God's word, that God is calling you to be a man of God. God is calling you to be a woman of God. Don't don't buy into the, well, I can choose my own identity. God has set you apart. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you and set you apart. But being true to who you are is about being true to who God is calling you to be. It's important for us to understand. I'm part of it. I love being a part of a group of people that would that would be that way. Jesus said it this way um, when when he was seeing some of these roots in the church in Luke's gospel. He said, "Meanwhile, the crowds grew until thousands were milling about and stepping on each other." Jesus turned first to his disciples, the church, and warned them: "Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, their hypocrisy." Time is coming when everything that is covered up will be revealed and all that is secret will be made known to all. I'm gonna rush through the end uh, just to get us to where we need to, to, to wrap this up. I know the time. What does this mean for us as a church? Well, this story of Ananias and Sapphira, it is, it is a challenging word and it is not solely about financial, although there is that element of it to the bigger issue is that we individually as moms and dads would portray truth in who we are. Can I just, I said it earlier and the spirit was kind of leading me in this direction even in worship that, that sometimes we, even as moms and dads, we portray something different to our kiddos. Like we got it all, you know, we're, we're great, everything's great. Boy, some of the best times of learning and growth in our family has been when I've had to apologize to my kids. And those are quite often, let me just be honest with that, Right? Um, it, it's just, just, it's just real and being not tilting the ruler. But as a church, we have an opportunity to be true and to be be uniquely who God is calling us to be. There's some things that I'm going to be unpacking for you in the next couple of weeks that 
that, uh, that, that I believe God is calling us to, to really be as a church. One of them has, has to do with small groups, and it's a big deal. Uh, it's, it's something that I believe God's calling us to. The other is how, how it impacts how we relate in our educational system. And God's really um, stretching us a little bit and how we can partner together with moms and dads in, in that, that space. But the whole piece of this is that we would be true and that we would love our community. The Gospel of John says it this way. It says, Jesus said, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. I'm going to ask the worship team, Pastor Clayton, to come and help me conclude today. You see, Ananias and Sapphira, they would have done well to to heed this, this word here. Oh, it's the amount of gift. It's what I can portray. Look at me. I'm a, I'm a teacher, I volunteer my time, I give a big check. Boy, that kingdom builders, they wouldn't be the same without me. And Jesus said, beware, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees in that previous verse, their hypocrisy. Presenting one thing, Jesus called them whitewashed tombs. He said, on the outside you look great, but inside there's something completely different. And through this story of Ananias and Sapphira, God's calling us all to be at a place where we'd be true and simply be who God's called you to be, be you. I'm gonna ask you to stand with me all over this room. See, Pastor John, it was a little bit of a heavy word, yeah. And, and sometimes it's one of those, those uh, there are those moments when the, the, the depth of the truth of Scripture really goes to places. The Bible says that the word is living and active, and it goes to places in our heart like a two-edged sword that, that our words can't. I don't know what that looks like for you. For me, it's just a continuing realization that I don't want to portray anything um, that would be false of what's happening in, inside of my life. You say, well, that, that means that sometimes we're less than perfect. Yeah, it does. And the beauty of that is when we portray the, the, the genuineness of that, you know what that gives room for? God's grace, God's mercy. And we can say to our small groups and our friends and our moms and dads and our people that were around and say, you know what, man, I missed it. I missed it in that opportunity. I, I missed a moment there and I apologize. Uh, God's still working on me. And this is an area that, that I'm, I'm really trying to, to improve in and do better, but I missed it right there. And don't you know that God just really um, smiles when his kids behave that way? I love it when my kids succeed and get the trophies and rah, rah, rah. And I also love it when they come to me and say, hey, Dad, I messed up. Like, I really missed the mark here. I'm, I'm working on it. And and you have an opportunity here for improvement. When we portray something that's different than who we really are, we really remove the need for God's grace. Some of you may be in the room, maybe joining us online, and you may be in this position in your life where you need God's grace to begin a relationship with him. In just a moment, we're gonna pray, and we're just gonna ask Jesus to come into our hearts and allow, um, allow his forgiveness to be real in our lives. Many of you have followed Jesus for a long time. Some of you, maybe you're just still checking it out. That's great. It's awesome. We're glad you're here. I can tell you this, that his grace is big enough to cover anything in your past because you're in a room of people who've needed that grace too. The Bible says that all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We all have things in our lives that are not pleasing. And there's a moment where we recognize that and say, how can I ever repay this debt? The news is you can't. Jesus paid it for you. And that's a beautiful, beautiful position to be in. And so I'm gonna ask you, church, before we go any further, we're gonna have a time of commitment in just a minute and prayer around the front for all of us to respond. But would you do me a favor and bow your heads, close your eyes. I wanna give an opportunity for those that may be in a position you wanna begin this relationship with Jesus to respond. This morning, the early service had five hands that were raised saying, I wanna start my my journey with Jesus. And, And I would love to pray together with you if you may be here in this room or maybe you're joining with us online. There'll be a little link that pops up, a connect card there that uh, we can pray together with you. We'd love to join our hearts with yours as well. 
But if you're here in this room, you said, I've never began a relationship with Jesus. Today's the day. I know that my life is going a direction away from God. I would love for that, that direction to change. That's what the word repentance means. It means to do a 180, to turn and go the other direction. If that's you, you'd say, I'd love to be included in the prayer uh, for, for that moment that I would make a decision. Would you do me a favor and, and honor us by allowing uh, us to join our hearts with you? All the heads are bowed and eyes are closed. But if you're here and say, would you, Pastor John, would you include me in that prayer? Would you just raise your hand and let me see that hand? And I'll acknowledge you, and then you can put it right back down. Thank you. See that hand? Anybody else? Anybody else? Awesome. Just want to give an opportunity. Thank you, sir, for for being bold and making that decision. Anybody else in the room? Awesome. Again, online, connect with us there, and we can pray together with you as well. Church, would you do me a favor and, and join our hearts and voices with this one who's raised their hand today so that we'll just go together, right? We heard last week we're better together. Would you all together with me and those that raised their hand and uh, just... Pray this prayer with me from your heart. Repeat after me, entire church, repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I love you. I'm sorry for my sins. Thank you for dying on a cross to purchase my forgiveness. I repent and I decide today to follow you. Thank you for loving me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've prayed that prayer today for the first time, we just would love to continue on this journey with you. One of the ways we can do that is that Connect card. I know sometimes it feels a little bit informal, but it's just really a tangible way for us to connect with you so that we can not just say, hey, great, awesome, all is well, but we can live this out with you and be a help to you. So do us a favor by filling that card out and do it uh, and connecting with us. Church, we're going to dismiss in a little bit different way here today. Um, when we talk about this idea of being true and being you, both individually and corporately, I'd love for us all to make a decision and a commitment, a visual commitment commitment that we would say we will be a church that would be true to what God is doing in and through our lives. And we're going to sing a song in just a minute as a commitment. But would you do me a favor and, and join me at the front? All of us across this room, would you just fill in these gaps up here? And we're going to have a time of dismissal from up here in prayer in just a moment. Come right now. Would you do that? Just lead out and do that. I know some of you say, oh, I feel uncomfortable. That's all right. Um, we'll just all be uncomfortable together, right? And uh, it'll be great. And just as a visual reminder of what God is doing. Here's why this is important as you're coming. Because, you, you know, Ananias and Sapphira, they, they got together in, in themselves and they kind of made a decision to be decept, deceptive in what they were doing. And sometimes even in, in our little demented minds, right? Been there the same. We can think that we can do things in a vacuum that don't have impact. And the truth of it is, is that God has called us as community to live out this faith in a really um, close, bumping elbows type way, right? In all this. And so as you look around even this room, I understand that some of you are like, oh, this is awkward or whatever. I get it. I understand that. But as you look across this room and as I'm trying to catch eyes with some of you or whatever, here's what I see in this room. I don't see people that tilt the ruler. I don't see people that are afraid to say, hey, I'm, I'm struggling today. But what I do see people is, uh, what I do see are people that would say, hey, God, we need your grace to live this out. We need your grace to be true and generous and to just be who you called us to be. And at the end of the day, the only person who makes that possible is Jesus. Man, aren't you glad that God saved you? And, and the minute you start feeling this like hypocrisy, start dwelling, well, you know, welling up inside of you and, and you have this temptation to portray something that is not true, remember where you were <laughs> and say, God, just break me again. I love the words of that song. It says, break my heart for what breaks yours. And the truth of it is, is sometimes what breaks his heart is our hearts <laughs> when we're not true to who God's called us to be. God, let us be a church that would be true that would be not full of a hypocritical attitude, but we would say, hey, we miss it sometimes. That's why we need Jesus, and he's the focus of everything we do. So Pastor Clayton, lead us in a song, and we'll be dismissed here. Just make that the commitment of your heart here today. Thank you, Jesus. When the music fades, Thank you, Jesus. and all is stripped away, and I simply come. 
Longing just to bring Something that's of worth That will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it Cause it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus King of endless worth And no one could express How much you deserve And though I'm weak and poor All I have is yours Every single breath I'll bring you more I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back, Lord I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it Cause it's all about you Yes, it's all about you, Jesus I'm coming back to the heart of worship Cause it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it Cause it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'll bring you more than a song I'll bring you more than a song It's all about you, Jesus I'll bring you more than a song I'll bring you more than a song Cause it's all about you, Jesus I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it Cause it's all about you It's all about you It's all about you it's all about you Yes, it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus Oh, we worship you, Jesus You Bring more than a 
Heavenly Father, we, God, we thank you for what you're doing uh, among us. God, thank you for your, your spirit just touching our hearts. Thank you for your presence, God. Lord, I pray that as we get ready to go, Lord, that you would just hide this word in our hearts, in our minds. God, bring it back to where we need it the most. In the moments when we're tempted, uh, Lord, to... be anybody else but ourselves. When we're tempted not to live out your truth, God, in those, in those tough moments, in those hard moments when we need you the most, I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit will give us strength or to honor you, to represent you, to speak truth, to do truth, Lord, for, not for our glory, not for our name's sake, but for yours, so the world will know who you are because of us. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless. We'll see you next week.